um, C image consortium. Two, what do we need to know in order to more safely produce oil from the deep ocean that we don't now know? And three, what is it that researchers in the Sea Image Consortium and other, uh, other uh, researchers will do over the next three years, and how will that contribute to our state of knowledge of deep water spills? Today, we have a number of researchers and students that have been involved in oil spill research that will speak to these three questions. These include Dr. David Hollander, who is chief scientist of the Sea Image Consortium, Professor of Geochemistry at USF, Dr. Stephen Murawski, Professor of Biological Oceanography and an endowed professor at USF, and they will be uh, joined by a panel of researchers to address your specific questions. Unfortunately, Bill Hogarth, Director of FIO, is unable to join us today, but we have Dr. David Hastings, Professor and Geoscientist from Eckerd College, and Dr. Dana Wetzel, Toxicologist from Moat Marine Lab. We are also joined in the audience by a number of other uh, researchers and students involved in oil spill research and who will be introduced during the panel discussion. Dr. Hollander will kick off the remarks. Thank you. Uh, no worries about the cane. Um, <laughs> it's safe here. Uh, again, thank you very much, uh, Dean Dixon, Provost Wilcox, and Representative Castor. Uh, you, you did a, a did a heavy lift to uh, help us with uh, executing the plan to get BP oil. So we are still eternally grateful. Again, I'm here to essentially tell you uh, what we've been doing in the College of Marine Science and in the uh, our our consortium, the Sea Image Consortium, the Center for the Integrated Modeling. Uh, an analysis of the Gulf ecosystems. Essentially, I'm going to show you what, what the, essentially we know now that we didn't know then, and those are really important features. Next slide, please. Um, what you see on the left-hand side is a theoretical view of a deep water blowout. And this had been constructed prior to uh, any of the a real blowout that had actually occurred. But what you can see is something really quite telling. You can see that it's very complex. You don't see a straight shooting up of oil uh, through the water column and onto the surface. But what you see is the formation of these subsurface plumes. And this has just been theorized. And one of these uh, uh, referenced here is our colleague uh, working at uh, Texas A&M University, Scott Sokolovsky. Uh, but when the blowout happened in 2010, we can see on the right uh, the release at the wellhead. This was a enormous uh, release of high pressure, high temperature, petroleum, which is made up of oil and gas, into the bottom of the ocean. And you can see an incredible complexity of the kind of interactions, the physical chemical interactions, both among molecules and among its exterior environment, so inter and intramolecular interactions. And this like really gave rise to the idea that we were then able to go out and document, indeed, that these subsurface plumes were actually occurring. And they occurred uh, between 900 to 1,200 meters thick. That is, it occurred between 900 meters to 1,200 meters deep, or 300 meters thick. That's close to 1,000 foot thick. And this was not, as you would expect, to see a black river of oil, uh, nor would it be viewed as uh, a context of a vinaigrette where you'd have an oil-water mixture. But indeed, the, the violence that, and the, that this oil and gas came out of the well uh, led to the formation of two parts to these oil plumes. One part was dissolved components. So more, normally you think that oil and water don't mix, but in petrochemicals, there are parts of petrochemicals where oil and water actually do mix, and the oil components can dissolve into the seawater. The second component was generated by the formation of what they call micro droplets, these very, very, very fine droplets of oil between 20 to 60 microns thick, which is about as thick as a width of your hair. And these essentially were both the dissolved component and the micro droplet component led to almost an invisible layer of petrochemical between 900 to 1200 meters thick. But when you brought it up and did the analyses, you could document that there was a significant amount of petroleum in the subsurface. So again, this was a very, very high pressure release. 
Uh, and some people have made the analogy that it was like an aerosol can, uh, where the gases uh, would collide with the liquid to form these micro droplets to give a fine mist of these fine, fine components of the, of the petroleum. Uh, we were also conducting high pressure experimental work uh, with three of our, uh, our partners in uh, the university up uh, in Germany, in uh, Hamburg, Technical University in Hamburg, Harburg, uh, the University of Calgary, as well as uh, University in West Australia. And what we're recognizing in these experimental work is that the application of the dispersants did not seem to be the driving force that led to the subsurface plumes. And this is a really critical question that still needs to be addressed, is the application of dispersants at the wellhead. This was the first time in history that that had ever been done, not based on scientific evidence that it would actually occur. Remember, these are extremely high pressure environments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our colleagues at the University of Miami uh, are able to make numerical models integrating both theory and evidence that shows uh, essentially the fate and transport of this oil in the water. And what you can see is a, a heat map where the red colors represent large droplets and the small droplets are represented in blue. And you can see the large droplets go quickly to the surface, but the micro droplets are at depth and are retained at depth. And you can see how they're channeled uh, into the northeast, into the DeSoto Canyon region, as well as to the southwest. And these plumes in the subsurface would impinge upon the continental slope environment in the DeSoto Canyon into the southwest, giving rise to what we called the toxic bathtub ring, as the oil would impinge upon the sediments, leaving a scar along that 900 to 1200 meter window. Next slide, please. Uh, what you see uh, in this diagram is the surface expression of the oil. And the surface expression essentially is what you traditionally see in an oil spill, a 2D vision. And indeed, satellite imagery uh, or satellites can be used, aircraft can be used to create these snapshots of the extent of surface oil coverage. Oh, because it is dangerous. Uh, surface oil coverage. Uh, the extent of surface oil coverage was up to 68,000 square miles, essentially the size of Florida. Uh, our researchers in our consortium, specifically Xuan Minhu is in the audience, uh, has been working on not only creating these images, but developing numerical algorithms to look at uh, the thickness of the oil, which is quite critical for ultimately determining the quantity of oil on the surface, which is really important for oil spill response strategies and how the federal government and industry are uh, uh, addressing the issue of oil spill response. Um, we can have the uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you see the surface oil coverage and you had the sediment, the, the plumes in the subsurface, uh, but we had this quick realization that there was going to be a bottom of the box as well. In other words, the sedimentary system. And so we developed a vision for how to sample in and around the deep water horizon oil well blowout, as well as in regions to the northeast, up towards the coastline and to the southwest. And we utilized uh, an instrument called the multi-core, which you can see in, on the left-hand side on the top right, which is a spider-like device, and you'll see it on the boat, uh, on the weatherbird. And that device can capture sediment cores uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and importantly retain the surface of that, sediment, of that sedimentary uh, core, which is quite critical for recognizing the most recent points of deposition. On the right-hand side, you can see an actual core that was collected uh, in December of 2000, excuse me, February of 2000, uh, 2012. Uh, essentially what we're able to do here is you can see how a sedimentary layer which essentially is associated with the timing of the deep water horizon. Typically sedimentation rates in this environment are one millimeter per year, but we can see that sediment associated with the blowout uh, is uh, essentially uh, now in this instance five centimeters thick, essentially being deposited extremely quickly. This site is not 
extraordinarily close to the Deepwater Horizon blowout. This is a site that's located 60 kilometers to the southwest. And you can see very clearly that the response is very broad in a regional context. 60 kilometers being the distance between either here in the Tampa campus or here in Sarasota. Through the, uh, what we're able to do is essentially utilize those sediment cores and slice them very finely and conduct chemical analysis of them and biological analysis to interpret what their origin is. And from that, we were able to recognize something quite important, that we were able to recognize oil, dispersing components, algal components, and clay components all in that horizon. And we developed a, a, a model for how could all of this material make their way down to the sediment surface so effectively, so quickly, and accumulate in a very, very broad region. Next slide. What we were able to discover is a process uh, which was uh, called the flocculent dirty blizzard, or others have called it MOSFA, marine oil snow sedimentation and flocculent accumulation. Essentially what it does is it links uh, the clay minerals, the algae, the oil and dispersant mix, and they are able to bind together and be ballasted to sink to the bottom. During the Deepwater Horizon blowout, there were a number of response strategies that were used for surface oil mitigation. You had burning of the oil, the application of the dispersants, and importantly, the opening of the Mississippi floodgates and diversionary channels to push water offshore, to push water out of the marsh to preserve as a priority these really sensitive coastal environments. But with this flushing of the Mississippi to the offshore, came clay minerals and nutrients. And these clay minerals and nutrients interact with the oil and the algae. And algae that is growing with those nutrients in the presence of oil and dispersants expressed a stress response. And they secreted a very gooey, slimy material that is not so pleasantly called sea snot. But it's very sticky. And the oil mineral aggregates, the dispersant, the dead algae, live algae, anything that was in the water column would stick to it and sink like a stone and accumulate on the ocean floor. And right now what we're trying to determine is really the role of the response strategies, the role of unexpected consequences of trying to save one part of the environment which ultimately can have an impact on the other. And this is a question of choices. This is a question as a responder of doing the least amount of harm and the trade-offs that are involved in that. And this is part of that equation. Next slide, please. Um, we've continued our work uh, in the sedimentary system. And what you see here is a perspective uh, of surface oil coverage on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, a map of sedimentary oil coverage. And what we can see on the left is, again, that standard view of how widely distributed the surface oil was, and again, it covered 68,000 square miles of the Gulf surface. And on the right-hand side, we can see that, and this is taken from 2012, that there is an offset, both temporally and spatially, relative to the surface oil expression. And that does reflect that sedimentary process, that flocculent blizzard, dirty flocculent blizzard process of settling and then this gradual migration of that material from the continental shelf and slope down to the deep depot centers. Collectively in this square, we've made estimates that anywhere between four to 10% of the liquid oil released is actually located in the bottom and having effects on the biota, namely the small organisms that live into the sedimentary environments. Uh, it's caused some of them to decline in density tremendously, 80, 90 percent, and in some cases to die off completely. Some instances the recovery has occurred and the bioturbation and the worms are back in the sediments, but in other locations they have still not arrived. And so there's other consequences to the sedimentary oil deposition besides simply the small worms, but actually larger organisms and fish specifically. Next slide, please. On the left-hand side, you see what they call a histogram of the distribution of compounds in the oil. So on the gray side is essentially a characterization of the crude oil. And on the right-hand side of that graph, uh, 
is samples from red snapper, from the livers of red snapper. And one can see that the histogram of those contaminants that are isolated from the liver of red snapper essentially are identical, an incredible similarity, resemblance to the crude oil, really documenting that crude oil is actually making its way into the food web and into important recreational and commercial fish species. Next slide, please. To really understand how these large organisms, in this instance fish, are affected, and what are the different vectors, how is oil actually making its way into the upper trophic levels, one needs to study a, an array of fish that have different life habitats, different strategies for living. And you can see on this map that uh, in this instance there's three species. The red snapper, obviously in red. Uh, the king snake eel, uh, which is, uh, uh, endears itself to some people, not all people. <laughs> Th that sample is about eight feet long, and any longer we would all go running and screaming away and the golden tilefish. And each one of those species has a different strategy. The snapper gets their food from the bottom, a benthic dependent fish. The king snake eel, they lie on the bottom. And they also get their food from the bottom. And the tilefish, the golden tilefish, uh, which can grow to 22 pounds and three and a half feet long, make these large burrows in the sediments. And they're constantly cleaning house. And with these oiled sediments, Essentially, when they're cleaning, they're getting oil in their gills in addition to their skin through transdermal, but also their food sources. So each of these species has a different life history, in spite of the fact that they actually may be co-located on the outer continental shelf, upper slope region. Next slide, please. What we see here is some real chemical analyses of an important component in the fish, namely bile. Bile is an assessment, is produced by the gallbladder, and reflects essentially what you ate yesterday. These samples are from the red snapper. And what you see very clearly is that in 2010 and 2011, the concentrations of two PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, these are components that are both carcinogenic and toxic. What we can see is that as you move from 2010 and 11 to 2012 to 2013, you can see an abrupt decline to lower levels of both of these PAHs, not necessarily the same decline. But what's important about that abrupt decline from 2011 to 2012 to 2013 implies that this was an acute, abrupt contamination event that the fish are now processing as contaminated sediments continue to migrate downslope, the fish are still eating contaminated food sources, albeit at lower concentrations, and are slowly getting back to what would be considered the baseline condition, which is a, an important uh, aspect that uh, Steve Morawski will address. On the right-hand side, you can see the effects of having a different life history. The tile fish, which burrow in the sediments, live on in the sediments uh, through the, getting uh, contamination through the skin and feed off the bottom, have the highest concentrations. And these are not just the highest concentrations in this region, but globally, these concentrations are extraordinarily high. The red snapper are, are higher than the golden tile, uh, than the king snake eel, and the question is why. One thing that the, beyond being just scary and having the name eel, and snake in the same animal name, uh, these animals produce an incredible amount of slime. And that is thought to be one of the mechanisms that actually reduce uh, their contamination level. So these are the kind of results that we have been able to get from the understanding of the behavior of the oil and gas released at high pressure, high temperatures into the cold ocean bottom, as well as looking at the transport of these, the mechanisms for how you can get oil onto the bottom, and ultimately how it has a biological and ecosystem impact. And questions are really, as you come back to baseline, what is that baseline? And ultimately, how long will the recovery take? So let me pass this now to uh, Dr. Morawski, who's
uh, we didn't mention was is actually the director of Sea Image. I'm just the chief science officer. Okay, Steve. Thank you, David. Uh, an excellent job uh, reviewing what is an enormous amount of information. I too want to thank uh, Representative Castor for being here and being such a stalwart champion for our research. Um, uh, Provost uh, Wilcox and, and Jackie Dixon as well. Uh, they've made our job uh, concentrating on the science so much easier. So my, my part of this is um, I want to address uh, the two remaining questions that uh, Dean Dixon uh, talked about. Number one, what do we need to know? And that is, as a society, what is it about the uh, deep, um, cold ocean uh, and ocean drilling that is ever more deeper in, in the Gulf of Mexico uh, in order to advise policy and response efforts for the oil spills of the future? And so this is kind of a, a little bit of a laundry list of just what it is we need to actually concentrate on in terms of future science. One of the major aspects that was mentioned by Representative Castor and, and also David is um, what are the baselines of contamination in the sediments, in the water, in the biota associated with the nearly 4,000 oil and gas rigs that currently exist in the western Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's ironic that uh, given all the research that we've done since this spill, um, there was very little to no baseline data for so many of the important natural resources of the Gulf. Um, the closest study that we could find occurred tw two decades ago and 300 miles west of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. That frankly is unacceptable in terms of trying to understand the impacts of an event like this. Uh, as as uh, Dr. Hollander noted, we're trying to study um, the baselines at the end of the event rather than the beginning of the event. And so we can see the reduction in the toxicity of oil on the bottom in the sediments and in the fishes. And that may give us some ideas about baselines, but it would have been much easier and less expensive for us to have collected those data in the first place. So clearly, um, trying to focus this industry on collecting um, uh, baseline information um, not only for the existing facilities, but also new and proposed facilities would make this job infinitely easier. Um, secondly, how do um, the depth of the water and the specific oil composition affect the efficacy of response mechanisms? By that I mean um, the deep water horizon was a mile deep and it was Louisiana sweet crude. Um, the industry now has uh, routinely drilled uh, wells in two miles of water. Um, in different formations, and different formations have different oil compositions like the gray bars that Dr. Hollander talked about. So if an accident happened in two miles of water depth with a um, Louisiana sour crude, um, would we have the same playbook that we had with Deepwater Horizon? And the answer is probably no. We know that um, at two miles uh, water depth, hydrate formation is much more problematic than in one uh, mile of water depth. And as well, the formation of these uh, micro droplets may be very much different with a different oil composition. So we need to know not only restudying Deepwater Horizon, but we need to know something about the family 